like you to turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 7 through 14. Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 14. Although this is not specifically a part of our series on the simplicity of wisdom or the pyramid of learning, it does very much tie in with the principles that we're talking about and, uh, and what we're going to apply here uh, tonight. So Philippians chapter 3 and beginning with verse number 7 down through verse number 14. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I count a loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after it that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we pray as we open up your word tonight, that you would open it to each one that's here tonight as well, to their hearts. We pray especially for the young people, but even as adults, that we might understand these principles and how they apply to our life specifically. And Lord, we pray that you would use your word to challenge us as we look to our future. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I'm sure all of you have heard at some time or another the phrase, your future is ahead of you. You've heard that phrase, right? But the truth is, your future is behind you. Most of your future is already behind you. And you say, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Look at verse number 13. It says, brethren, I count not myself apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth onto those things which are before. We do want to reach to the future, but we need to understand that much of our future is already behind us. Now, what I mean by that is, first of all, much of your future was decided in the womb. Turn over your Bibles to Psalm, put a marker in Philippians, we'll come back to it, but go over Psalms chapter 139. Psalms chapter 139. And verses 13 through 18. Psalms chapter 139, beginning with verse number 13 down through verse number 18. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written. Now we call that today DNA, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I could count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I'm still with thee. You see, when you were in your mother's womb, at the point of your conception, your life was already written. Much about your future was already set. Your physical futures were set in the womb. Your mental ability, not your grades in school, but your mental ability was determined in the womb. Your personality was also determined in the womb. I've had five children. I've been there for every one of their births. Uh, I just thought that was my part in the job. Since my wife had to be there, I just felt I should be there with her. And I remember each one of them being born. I remember thinking how different they were in personality at the very moment of birth. And so much of who you are today, much of who you're going to be in the future has already been determined. Now, you can fine tune it. Your basic bone structure and how you're built was determined the wound. Now you can exercise and, and, and fine tune it, but it's pretty well set. You can't make yourself taller. You, you, you can't uh, change the, the features of your face, maybe plastic surgery, but the reality is you're still who you were conceived as. 
Your mental ability was set. You can fine tune it by how you study and how you listen and learn, but it's pretty well set what your ability is. Your personality, you can, you can do things to, uh, to improve your personality, but the person who you are was determined at the point of conception. It's kind of like was one boy, he was not doing well in science, and he went home with his report card, and he went to his dad, and he said, Dad, we learned in science today that we are who we are because of the genes that we receive from our parents. So, Dad, it's your fault I'm failing in science. And that may be somewhat true, but he had also the opportunity to fine tune what God had given him. But we are already, much of who we are and who we're going to be has already been decided before we were even brought into this world at the moment of conception. Much of who you are and who you're going to be in the future was decided in the first five years of life. By the time scientists tell us in studies, by the time you are five years old, 70 to 80% of who you are is already set. By the time you're five years old, 70 to 80% of who you are is already set. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number six says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The word train there comes from a Hebrew word, which in the root form means to make tasty. The idea of training up a child is to make uh, things tasty to them when they're young. Uh, my children were all born here in Hawaii, and they were all raised here in Hawaii. And when they went off to the mainland, to Bible college, they couldn't understand why you couldn't get rice at McDonald's. Because rice was something that was tasty to them, because that's what they had been raised on from the time they were born. And as they've grown up, you talk to my son, Caleb, and, and he would ha rather have rice than potatoes. He'd have, rather have rice than just about anything. He loves rice. Now, if you're brought up in a Hawaiian culture, you like poi. Now, I've lived in Hawaii since 1980. I was not born here. I was not raised here. And I've eaten poi. And even though I've eaten it many times, I still think it tastes like wallpaper paste. Now, don't ask me how I know what wallpaper paste tastes like, all right? But I don't like poi. But I've got a number of local friends that think there's nothing better than some two-finger poi. Now, if you were raised down south, you probably like grits. Now, if you don't know what grits are, grits are sand from the beach that they try to give you for breakfast. <laughs> They just put butter and other things inside of it to make it better, but ultimately it's just sand from the beach. I live down south, and everywhere you went for breakfast, they served grits, and they always wanted to give me grits, but I didn't like them. Why? Because it was not made tasty to me when I was zero to five years of age. And so a lot of what you like and who you are and, and a lot of your future was decided before you were ever born, when you were conceived. It was decided in those first five years of life. And parents, that's why it's important that you understand how important those first five years are. A lot of who you are and who you're going to be, your future was decided by what you've already learned till today. Turn over to Proverbs chapter one. Proverbs chapter one. And look at verse number two through verse seven, Proverbs chapter one, verses two through seven. It says to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase not learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now, it goes from a young man in verse number four to a man in verse number five. But what you're going to become, what you're going to be as a man, as a woman, as an adult, is pretty well already determined by what you've learned as a young person and what you are learning as a young person as well. There's many areas that this is proven on. For example, when I was in high school, I never learned how to type. I, I didn't want to take typing class because it was a lot of practice and I didn't want to practice. And so I never learned how to type. And so today, uh, whenever I'm on the computer, I'm going like this because I did not learn how to type. 
And the fact that I did not learn how to type as a young person has really determined much of my future as an adult. Same thing is true in the area of music. Music is much harder to learn when you're an adult than it is when you're a child. Language. Learning language as a child is really, missionaries will tell you, their children learn the language much faster than they do. And if you don't learn a language now when you're young, it's harder to do in the future. All of these things limit your future opportunities and abilities because you did not learn them earlier on in life. So no matter what age you are now, what you've learned up until today is going to limit your future tomorrow. We talked this morning about the pyramid of learning. Put it on the screen here if you can, fellas. And we talked about the pyramid of learning. And the pyramid of learning, we have four levels, and that's knowledge, facts and information, wisdom, the skill to use the knowledge that we have, and then instruction is the discipline to do what we know we're supposed to do, and then understanding is how to apply what we've learned in one area to another area. And you can review this morning's message if you weren't here to learn more about that. But one of the things we talked about is uh, with a pyramid, the, the broader the base, the higher the pyramid goes. And so wherever your base is right now is going to determine how high you're going to go in your future. That's what it really comes down to. And, and so whether you're a young person, realize that what you are learning today, why is this so important to learn? Because everything you're learning today is determining your future tomorrow. And as an adult, we have a lot of catch up to do. We have to learn it now because it's not going to get easier later. And whatever we've learned now will determine how far we can go in our future. The Bible says in Psalms 119 and verse number 99, it says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Really, the ultimate future is that you ought to be going further than those who have taught you. Young people, you ought to go further than your parents because you're building on what they started for you. You ought to go further than your teachers because you're building on what they started for you. And so the, the base is important because whatever base we build will determine how far we can go in the future. And your future is also behind you because it's decided by your experiences in life. Everything that you have experienced up till today is, is part of what you're going to be tomorrow. In, sec, in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, it says, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. Now this is an interesting, these two verses are interesting because if you read that chapter, it's one of those chapters where it, said, <coughs> it just kind of goes through a whole list, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And every verse has got like four or five names in it. And it's just going through all these names of all the different generations. And it stops here in 1 Chronicles, Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And, and it uses two verses to talk about one person. Jabez. And it says, and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him with sorrow. Now, in the Bible days, they didn't name people by what they liked. They named people because of something significant at that moment of time. And so his mother called Jabez sorrow. That's what the name means because there was something in his life that was unhappy at that time. Maybe she had a difficult childbirth. Maybe she uh, actually died in childbirth and named him right before she died. Maybe her husband had passed away or something else had happened. But something tragic happened in his life when he was born. So she named him Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Now, what's important to see here is whatever experience Jabez and his family went through when he was younger, it affected him. It cannot help but do that. I was raised in a very abusive home, and, and that, that has affected me even today at 63 years of age. 
If you went through a traumatic experience, a, a divorce of your parents or a loss of, of a parent when you were young, that affects you even today. If you were abused, especially if you were sexually abused or maybe even raped, that's going to affect you even today. And that's going to affect you for the rest of your life. It cannot help but do that. And every experience we go through, both good and bad, is going to determine our future. What has happened to you in the past cannot help but change your future tomorrow. But here's the key. Jabez says, I was born in sorrow, but I'm not going to live in sorrow. I'm going to ask God to bless me. Despite whatever, we don't know exactly what happened, whatever happened in his life, despite that, Lord, I want you to bless me. See, so often we become victims of our past throughout our future. And Jabez said, nope, not going to do that. Your experiences do not need to define you. Now, they will always be a part of who you are. In Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 20, Joseph said this, but as for you, talking to his brothers who sold him into slavery, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. See, Joseph, I, I mean, I went through a difficult childhood with an abusive father, a drunkard for a father, but my brothers, they, my brother hated me, I think, and he, he picked on me a lot and all the rest of it, but he never sold me into slavery. He thought I was his personal slave, but he never sold me into slavery. And here's Joseph. He was sold into slavery. He ended up in jail, and that could have defined him for his future, for the rest of his life. He said, nope, not going to do it. God will even take the bad and make it for good. I wish I'd never had the father I had that abused me like he did. But I thank God for who I am today. Because God even used that bad experience to, to, to make my life for the future. So whatever experiences you've gone through in life up to this point, and I know in this room there are people that have gone through terrible, terrible things. And my heart goes out to some, thinking what you had to endure and what you had to go through, maybe as a child or, or possibly as an adult, and, and the situations that you had to face in life, and, and they're, they are terrible. But we live in a society today where we have become defined by our experiences instead of overcoming them for our future. Now, understand you can't just ignore them and act like they never happened. You know what an interesting verse to me is? Hebrews eleven thirty one. This is what it says. Listen, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, you remember the story of Rahab? She was a harlot and she helped the spies of Israel. And because of that, God blessed her. And eventually she became the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. And yet, even though she had a, I believe, must have been a wonderful life to be the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus Christ, she was still called Rahab the harlot. Because that doesn't go away. If you've, if you've been abused, it doesn't go away. If you've been sexually assaulted or raped, it doesn't go away. If you've been through the military folks through traumatic things in, in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever it was, that doesn't go away. But neither does it have to define your future. But it will change your future. You can't just ignore and act like it never happened because that's part of who you are. And that's part of what makes me who I am today. So, so I hate to give you the bad news, but most of your future has already been decided. You can't do anything about it. You can't change who you were conceived as, as a child in the womb. You can't change that. You, you were made that way and nothing's going to change that. You can't change what happened to you from zero to five years of age. That's 70% of who you are as an adult. You, you can't change in, in your life. You can't change the, the uh, things that you've learned up until now. You can't go back and learn things differently. 
I can't go back in high school and take typing. I can't go back and, and learn how music or learn a language. You can't change your experiences. But you do not have to be defined by them. And that's what we need to understand. Stop blaming your past for your present sin. Stop blaming your past for your present sin. Stop trying to change the things that are already done and over. You see, we spend the majority of our time fretting over, worrying over, and trying to do something about something we had no control over and we cannot go back and change. And that is also affecting our future. So stop worrying about that. Now, I'm not saying you, you shouldn't try to do something about it. I, I should learn how to type. I, 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 want, I wanted to learn how to play an instrument, in fact. In fact, when my wife and I got married, she's a pianist, and I thought, well, here's a great. I don't have to pay for instruction. I can just have her teach me. And after two lessons, we decided it was better to stay married. <laughs> because she was such a lousy teacher, I couldn't learn how to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in one lesson. You know, but you can go back and change some of those things. And like I said, you can, even though you're made a certain way, you can become the best of what you were conceived as. And you can go back and you can do, but, but we spend too much time trying to change the past instead of saying, you know what? I can't change 70% of who I am, but I can work with the 20 or 30% I have opportunity to change. So your future is behind you, but your future is also today. Go over to Psalms chapter 25. Psalms chapter 25 and look at verse number 7. Psalms chapter 25 and verse number 7. Psalms 25, 7, it says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Now when God says, remember not, when the psalmist says, remember not the sins of my youth, it's not that he's asking God to forget all the bad things he did. Now, thank the Lord, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. And whatever we've done, God will forgive us for that if we will confess it and repent of it and get it right with God. But this verse is a little bit different. What he's saying is, he's saying, listen, remember not the sins of my youth, in understanding that those sins are the sins that I have to live with today. Now, I'm going to illustrate this, and I need some help to do this. I need somebody in the room here. It's about around 10 years old. So who's around 10 years old that can help me out? All right, you come on up here. You're going to be my first one. We're going to create a scale, a, a timeline of your life. You remember timelines in school? We're going to create a timeline in your life. So here's the, he represents 0 to 10 years of age. Now, somebody else is around 20 years of age. I need somebody to volunteer to help me with that. No, Brother Grady, don't lie in church, all right? Uh, somebody around 20 years. Now, if I don't get a volunteer, I'm going to be volunteer. Okay, come on up here and help me out. And you stand right here. So 0 to 10, 10 to 20 years of age. Now, I need somebody around 30 years of age, give or take. Sit down, Tupu. All right. I'm preaching next week on lying, all right? All right, somebody around 30 years of age, all right, Mrs. Fine, would you come on up here and stand up here? And then I need somebody around 40 years of age. Somebody's around 40 or so, and then do it. I got a couple of kids pointing at their, their parents and also. I need somebody around 40 years of age. You, are you really 40? You look more like 50 or 60, brother. Baby. You're not lying, are you? <laughs> all right, 40 years of age. You guys step up a little bit because we're going to get a longer line. You move right over here. Stand right over here. Come on, right over here. Stand right over here so we can get a little longer line. And then you come and stand a little space from him and so on. All right, now I need somebody about 50 years of age. So Tupu, you're about that age there. Or Brother Paul, you come on up here. You're around 50. Come on, Brother Paul, we'll put you up here. All right, and now I need somebody around 60 years of age. Somebody's around 60. So help me out here. Come on, honesty in church. I'm going to volunteer somebody if somebody doesn't volunteer here. 60 years of age. Come on. All right. Brother Roman, you come on up here and stand right over here. And then I need somebody around 70 years of age. Anybody around 70 years of age? All right. Then I'm at the, I, I know I'm going to have to get a volunteer here. So um, Brother Brant, I'm going to volunteer you here because you got gray hair. You look like you're, you're a distinguished <laughs> elderly servant of the Lord. And so we're going to put you up here at 70. And then Brother Linda Mood, we're going to put you up here for 80. All right. Because you... <laughs> 
you look like you're about ready to die anyway, so <laughs> come on up here and next to it. Now, imagine this is the timeline of your life, okay? You were born at zero, you went 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age. Move over just a little bit more there. And so uh, the average lifespan today is going to be about 80. So most of you, this is your life right here. Okay, now here's the thing I want you to see. If you are a teenager today, you're somewhere between these two. And whatever you do today, you're going to have to live with all the way down there. Use drugs, you're going to have to live with that. And the consequences, both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You have sex outside of marriage, you're going to live with that. You see, wherever you're at, now if you're a single and you're over here somewhere in this age group here, whatever you do, you're going to live with those consequences for the majority of your life. See, the thing we don't stop and think about is what you do today, everything you do today, you're going to live with all the way down here. See, I'm 63 years old. This is our 60 to 70 age group. I'm right in here. Now, I'm going to ask you to come up here, if you would, and you're going to represent me as a teenager. So you're going to stand right between the two of these. Now, folks, I'm 63 years old, and I am still living with choices that Wayne back there made. And if I could, I would go back in time and I would smack him and say, get your act together, you idiot. Because what you're doing right now, I'm still in pain for over there. And I can guarantee you that every one of the adults in this room could stand up and tell you something they are regret and they still feel guilt over. They're still paying the physical, emotional, and spiritual consequences of decisions they made back here or sometimes here, or sometimes here, even here, I'm only halfway through my life. I still got half of my life. Whatever he does now, he's going to live with it for the next 40 years, good or bad. Just the simple fact that this kid here, this idiot thought it was not good to go to typing class. I'm still, every time I'm going like this, I'm thinking, what an idiot that boy was. Get your act together. <laughs> But I can't do that. I cannot go back here and do that. So you teenagers, you young people, you young adults, you young married couples, you parents with young children, you cannot go back and change it. You can't go back and live with that kid at five years old again. You can't. You cannot go back and start your marriage over again and, and do it differently. And you're going to live with that. We've been married 41 years and we're still living with some of the stupid things that I did when we were first married. That I wish I could go back and change because the hurt is still there. Now she's forgiven me and she's, she's so gracious towards me, but I know the pain is still there and I know it still pops up in her head. And you've got to understand this. If you leave with nothing else tonight, young people, understand this. Understand it. Thank you. You may sit down. So your future is today. Every time you make a decision, stop and think about what is the consequences. What am I going to have to live with by making this decision today? It says, remember not the sins of my youth. I remember some of the sins. I remember a lot of the sins I did as a teenager. And I still feel guilty when I remember them. And I still suffer the consequences of those. But as the sins here, what it's referring to is more the habitual sins. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, besetting sins are habitual sins. They're habits. You start smoking as a teenager, you're probably still going to be smoking as an adult. And one day you're going to have a little hole cut in your throat and you're going to be smoking through that hole. 
You start using drugs, you start drinking, you start, whatever you start doing as a teenager, it most likely is going to become a habit in the years to come. And so understand that what you start now, you're going to live with for the future. Look at Psalms 25 and look at verse 18. Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. See, the psalmist saying, I still remember what I did and I'm still suffering the consequences of it and I'm still dealing with the struggles with it. You know what? I deal with this all the time like with pornography and you get some young fellow and he says, well, you know, when I get married, it won't be a problem anymore. Forget that. You start looking now it's going to be a battle later. It just doesn't go away. And when you open that door, you open the door to a habit, a lifetime habit, and you deal with those consequences. There's not a, a man in this room that will tell you, if they're honest, they'll tell you, I looked at pictures years ago and I can still close my eyes and see those. Satan can't put a thought in your mind, but he can remind you of what you looked at. I can't tell you how many 30-year-olds have come in and suffering with the guilt of premarital sex, even 20, 30 years later. Those consequences don't go away. The sins of our youth are not just sins we committed as a youth, but they're habits we started as a youth. Habits are harder to break the older you get. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee also youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, what does he mean by youthful lust? It's just things that young people struggle with. I have found the same things young people struggle with, the same things adults do. I know 40, 50 year old adults that struggle with pornography. I know 40 or 50 year old adults that struggle with drinking or drugs or all the rest of it. It's not that. That is what he means youthful sins. Youthful lust are things that you start as a young person and it just keeps going on as a habit in your life. You need to confess and forsake them. Look at Psalms chapter 32 and look at verse number one. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verse number five, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Whatever your sin is, you need to get it right with God. It doesn't matter what age you are. Young person, you get right with God. But adult, you need to get right with God. Because it doesn't get better, it gets worse. It gets worse. And it becomes a habit. And it becomes a bigger and bigger struggle in your life. So don't start. And if you started, stop it now. Because otherwise, you're going to be dealing with this in the future. It doesn't go away. There are consequences to our sin. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For what a man soweth, that shall also reap. And there are adults in this room that are paying the price for their stupidity as a teenager or as a young person. But there's also forgiveness and restoration. Psalms chapter 51, David confessed his sin before God and God so graciously forgave him. In fact, here's what I love. In 1 Kings chapter 9. Now remember, David committed adultery and murder. He, he lost his integrity. After that point, David never yet, never once talked about his personal integrity. But listen to what God says in 1 Kings chapter 9 at verse number 4. And if thou will walk before me, as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and judgments. Isn't God good? Even despite his sin, because David confessed it and got it right with God, God was able to say years after he died that David was a man of integrity. I am so thankful God's forgiven me for my stupid acts as a teenager and as a young adult and even as an older adult. But even when God forgives, there are still consequences to our sin. And David paid the price for his sin. He lost his family. He lost his child. His ch other children rebelled against him. Uh, he had a lot of consequences for his sin, even though God forgave him. And that's what we need to understand. God forgives, but there's still consequences to what we do. Back in Psalms 25, 7, it says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. 
The word transgressions is not just a repeat of sins. It literally means rebellion, rebellion. One of the problems of youth is rebellion against authority, rebellion against God and our parents and the authorities in our life. One of the things I, I challenge all of us to do, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says, rebellion is as a sin in witchcraft. And be careful of this area of rebellion. My mom was a single mom raising five kids by herself. And you know what? I made her life miserable because I rebelled against her. And to this day, my mom's been dead for what, 15 years or 10 years? And to this day, I still regret that. When she was alive, I think almost every time I talked to her on the phone, the first thing I would say to her is, Mom, did I tell you I'm sorry for how I treated you when I was a kid? But I can't go back and change that. So let me challenge you, whether you're a young person or adult, do this. Whenever you're going to do something, stop and take the 20-year backwards look. Just stop for a moment, step forward in your life 20 years, and look back, and what do you want that kid to do, or that young adult, or whoever it is to do right now? What do you want them to do right now? And then do that. Because one day you're going to look back like me, and you're going to be sorry, and it doesn't matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, you can't change it. I often tell young people, listen, 20 years from now, you're probably going to have a kid about your age. What do you want them to do? That's what you should do. Because they're probably going to do to you what you did to your parents. That's called parents' revenge. Take the 20-year backward look before you do something. Don't rebel against God. Don't rebel against the authorities in your life. And then it says in Psalms 25, 7, it says, according to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. I'm so thankful for God's mercy. I'm thankful for his mercy and salvation. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5, it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. I'm thankful that God's not going to determine whether I go to heaven or hell based upon how I've lived my life because I've done a lot of bad. I talk to people all the time and says, Pastor, I'm really a good person. No, we're not. We're bad people that sometimes do good things. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'm thankful as a 14-year-old boy that I realized that I got scared because I realized how bad I really was. And up to then, I thought God had to scale in heaven and my good works would be on one side, my bad works would be on the other side. And I thought if my good outweighed my bad, I'd go to heaven. If my bad outweighed my good, I'd go to hell. And I thought about that. And up to that point, I kind of thought, well, I'm doing more good than bad. And then I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I'm a lot worse than good. I'm a lot more bad than good. And I got really scared. And that's when I said, Lord, I need your mercy. Because it's only by the mercy of God that we can have salvation. It's only by the mercy of God that we can have eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'm thankful that I don't have to work my way into heaven. It's not based on anything I've done in my life, good or bad. It's based on what God did for me when he sent his son to die for me. And folks, I'm 63 years old. I'm over here. I'm closer to the end of my life than the beginning of my life. But you know, there's one thing I'm thankful. I can look back to that Wayne at 14 years old. And I can remember the day that Wayne bowed his head and his heart and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. And he called upon the name of the Lord. Now shall be saved, the Bible says. And he did that. And even today, 50 years later, I know I'm going to heaven because of what he did that day. That's the one good thing that idiot did, is he was smart enough to say, I need Jesus. Are you smart enough to say, I need Jesus? Is there somewhere on your timeline, whether it was at 14, 5, 14, 24, 44, even today, is there somewhere in your timeline that you said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner? That's important. You need the mercy of God. You need the mercy of God in your life. Your future 
is already decided in the past. Your future is being decided today by the decisions you make today. But your future also will be decided tomorrow. Let's turn over to James chapter 4. And we're on our way downhill, so stay with me, all right? James chapter 4. And look at verses 13 through 17. It says, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appear for a little time then vanishes away. But that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. And this pastor is saying, listen, if, you're, if you've got your future all planned out, you better think again. Now, there's nothing wrong with planning for your future, but you understand, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Let me ask a couple questions here. Uh, let's go over here. When are you going to graduate from high school? You don't know. Because that's in the future, isn't it? All right? Now, let me ask another question here. When are you going to graduate from college? Not sure. Not even sure if you're going to college yet or not, are you? But he's still got to graduate high school. Now, when are you getting married? Next week. Next week, he says. All right. You want me to find somebody? I could find somebody. We can get this taken care of here. He doesn't know that, does he? Now, if I turn to somebody and say, when did you get married? You can tell me, right? All right. He's got the date down. That's good. All right. But he doesn't know that yet. So when, when are you, uh, when are you going to have children? He's looking at me like, what? See, he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that yet. JJ, when are you going to retire from the military? You haven't even joined the military yet, have you? Now, Fred Saxon, he's thinking about when he's going to retire from the military. But you haven't even decided if you're going to join the military or not. See, these are all things that are in the future. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. And I want you to see that. And that's this. Every one of those things didn't turn out like I expected. You know when I expected to graduate from high school? 1973. Do you know when I graduated from high school? I never did. I joined the military and through circumstances, I ended up not getting my high school degree because I had to go to basic training. I never expected to graduate from Bible college. I never even planned to go to Bible college. I joined the military in order to stay home. I went in the National Guard, the Air Force Reserves, so I could go to the military and then go home. I never went home. I ended up moving to Mississippi and to, and, and to Texas and Mississippi and, and Florida. I never went home. I, I didn't marry the girl that I thought I was going to marry originally. And you know what, by the way? I'm glad I didn't. At the time, I thought this is a great girl. And now I realize if I'd married her, I'd be miserable and I married the right girl. Right? Okay. <laughs> I am thankful my future didn't turn out like I planned. Now, it's not wrong to plan. I think you ought to plan and graduate from high school, and you should. I think you ought to plan and go into college or join the military and to get married and all the rest of that. But realize that God is in control and we can plan and we can prepare and I think because I planned and prepared God moved in my life to bring me where I am today but ultimately God is in control and what I need to do is pray what I need to do is pray do you think that brother Grady should pray for his wife how many think he should pray for his wife yeah sure right and you think she should pray for him oh yes in fact, we should be praying for Mrs. Grady because she's married to Brother Grady. So, should not you teenagers be praying for your wife or your husband? I don't know who that is. Does God? He does. So, wouldn't it be a good idea to start praying for them today? Later on, you can pray for them by name. Now you can just call them Mrs whatever you are, or mister, you know, but you ought to pray for him. 
See, we need to understand that our future is not in our hands. Ultimately, it's in God's hands. And your future is tomorrow. And you can make tomorrow's decisions today. Did you know that? You can make tomorrow's decision today. Joshua 24, 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you, serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, Joshua said, I don't care what tomorrow brings, I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to do what's right. And you go back to Joshua chapter 1, and that's where it all started. God said, listen, if you will do this, I will bless you. You can make, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but you can start making tomorrow's decisions today. I'm going to use another illustration. I got one verse and I'm going to close, I promise, all right? So I, I'm going to need some help with this illustration here. So let's see. Uh, Brother Steve, can you come up here and help me out? I want you to do something real simple for me, all right? I want you to stand right here and I want you to step over there by the piano. No, 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 no. Stand right here and step over there by the piano. No, no, no. You're not listening to me. I didn't take, say to take steps to the piano. I said go from here over by the piano. Can you do that? No. All right, thank you. You can sit down. See, I cannot get from here to my future over there without some steps in between. And the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 37 and verse number 23 that the steps of a good man are, are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. You want to determine where your future is going to be 20 years from now? Take the right step today. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the things of itself, for the th I'm sorry, take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you are where God wants you to be today, you will be where, ready to be where God wants you to be tomorrow. It's that simple. That's how you can decide your future. I can decide all of my future by taking the right step today. And then to do it again. And to do it again. And ultimately that next step will be my future. It'll get me from there to the piano. These are life-changing principles. Stop fretting over the 70% that's already set in your life. Now, you need to deal with the past and you need to deal with those issues and all the rest. I'm not saying you just ignore them. But you can't go back and change that. But you can change tomorrow. And the way to change tomorrow is by being in the right place today. And then you're ready to be where God wants you to be tomorrow. Now this principle, young people, I guarantee you, six, 40 years from now, you will be praising God and thanking me. Write me a letter in my grave thanking me for what I taught today. If you will apply it. But there's not a one of you in this room, doesn't matter if you're 14 or 64 or 74, that these principles don't still don't apply to. Because today is the beginning of the rest of your life.